Perfect. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Happy National Drink Wine Day. Happy Random Acts of Kindness Week. In addition to Black History Month, it is also Chocolate Lovers Month. But I hasten to add that these are not the same things at all, just a happy accident. And it's also World Understanding Month, which fits very well with why we are gathered here tonight. Uh, in a nod to the arts and sciences, it's worth mentioning that today's notable birthdays include Italian physicist Alessandro Volta, born in 1745. He was the inventor of the first battery. My remote control, thank you, sir. Uh, and author Toni Morrison, born in 1931. She was the first African-American woman to win a Nobel Prize. Thank you, sis. And with that, I officially welcome you one and all to Skeptical Inquirer Presents. This is a series of live online presentations from experts who are devoted to advancing science over pseudoscience, media literacy over conspiracy theories, and critical thinking over magical thinking. My name is Leanne Lord, and I'm delighted to be your host. I am a stand-up comedian and author, and if you are so inclined, you can find out more about me and my work at veryfunnylady.com. I'm also very pleased to share once again that my new dry bar comedy special is out. And a dry bar comedy special is like having an HBO special, but better because it's free. Uh, and you can watch it for free in the dry bar app or on my website, which is again, veryfunnylady.com. Uh, a few reminders, uh, the Center for Inquiries Coronavirus Resource Center continues the work of fact-checking misinformation and sharing reliable news sources at centerforinquiry.org slash coronavirus. And as usual, they've curated some great articles this week. I recommend The Atlantic's How to Beat the Pandemic by Summer. And from NBC News, how billions in pandemic aid was swindled by Carnotas and crime syndicates. Um, just amazing. Uh, I encourage you also to subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer magazine. There are two ways to do that, digital and print. And the print subscription gives you access to the digital version. So go on to skepticalinquirer.org and hit that subscribe button at the top right of your screen and avail yourself of the knowledge. And uh, while we're all, uh, at it here, please mark your calendar for our next Skeptical Inquirer Presents, which is on March 4th. We'll be welcoming back Paul Offit. Uh, he'll be talking with us about SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Where do we stand? And if you've not been here before, if this is your first time, welcome. I want to let you know that the flow of the evening is easy. You get to keep doing whatever you're doing. I'm sure you're doing great. Uh, I will introduce our guest. Uh, they will razzle and dazzle, after which we will open it up for your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see those little icon there that says Q&A. And that's the place for you to type your questions in the form of a question. And if you miss any of the talk tonight, it is being recorded and will be available on skepticalinquirer.org. And now, I, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting our guest and hearing him speak uh, way back in 2019 at SciCon, which really feels like a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, he is a distinguished uh, professor of atmospheric science at Penn State with joint appointments in the Department of Geosciences and the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. In 2018, he received the award for public engagement with science from the American Association of the Advancement of Science and the Climate Communication Prize from the American Geophysical Union. In 2019, he received the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement. And in 2020, when the rest of us were curled up on our couches watching Netflix, he was elected to the United States National Academy of Sciences. Uh, he is the author of several books, including Dire Predictions, Understanding Climate Change, uh, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, and The Madhouse Effect, How Climate Change Denial is Threatening Our Planet, Destroying Politics, and Driving Us Crazy. So speaking with us tonight about his latest book, The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet, please welcome Michael Mann. Michael, you have the con. Thanks so much, uh, Leanne. It's great to be here with you um, and to see you again after uh, a, a few years. Um, let me share my screen and get right to it. Uh, I want to leave plenty of time for discussion uh, Q&A, so I'm going to sort of do the rapid version of this talk. Um, uh, the new climate war, 
the fight to take back our planet. Um, and so I'll talk about what the new climate war is versus the old climate war, something that we're largely past. But what I, I want to start out with is just talking a little bit about the science. For example, the climate change projections. Um, you often hear critics say that um, you know you can't trust these climate scientists, you can't trust um, these models, um, they're alarmists. Um, so let's look not at the projections of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or any climate scientists I know. Let's look at the climate projections of ExxonMobil. Um, this is from their own internal documents uh, that were ultimately uh, leaked um, to uh, the public. Back in the early 1980s, ExxonMobil had their own team of scientists who were actually looking at the potential impact of our continued burning of fossil fuels and the increase in carbon dioxide concentrations and the warming of the planet. And in their internal report, ExxonMobil's own scientists used the word catastrophic to describe what impacts we would likely see if we fail to act. At the same time, they made a remarkable, a remarkable prediction. Um, as uh, Niels Bohr once famously said, predictions are hard, especially about the future. Well, they made a, a prediction about the future back in uh, the early 1980s, and they predicted not only how much warming we would see to within a tenth of a degree Celsius, but they predicted successfully the concentration of carbon dioxide that we would be at um, at this point in time. What's so remarkable about that is that required them to predict that they would be successful in preventing any efforts to curtail the burning of fossil fuels, to decarbonize our economy, to move away from fossil fuels. They were able to predict that they and other fossil fuel companies would be successful in blocking any efforts to rein in climate or fossil fuel burning and climate change so that we would arrive at CO2 levels like we actually see today. Now, if we had acted decades ago, uh, back in the mid 1990s, there was a clear scientific consensus um, that, uh, you know, that um, climate change was now detectable. There was a detectable human influence uh, on the climate. Well, ExxonMobil, um, of course, instead of coming public, going public uh, with their internal findings, instead spent decades trying to discredit independent science, um, the estimates from climate scientists who had come up with the same answer that their own scientists had come up with. Um, they ended up getting rid of that division. Um, they didn't release any of that information, and they spent hundreds of millions of dollars in a massive disinformation campaign aimed at discrediting the basic science of climate change. And so what that means is that rather than having acted decades ago, if we had acted decades ago, you can see how relatively gently we would be able to bring down our carbon emissions and still avoid a dangerous one and a half degrees Celsius, roughly three degree Fahrenheit warming of the planet. If we had acted two decades ago, back in the late 1990s, when we already knew there was a scientific consensus that climate change was real and human caused, it would have been fairly, uh, fairly straightforward to bring our carbon emissions down to decarbonize our economy. But what two decades of inaction have bought us is rather than a trip down a bunny slope, we now have to go down a black double diamond slope. If we are to avoid warming the planet more than a dangerous one and a half degrees Celsius, we have to bring our carbon emissions down dramatically now in the years ahead, in the, in the decades ahead. In fact, the, you often hear the, the, the um, assertion that we need to basically act within the next decade. We need to bring our carbon emissions down by a factor of two within the next decade at this point to uh, avert a one and a half degree Celsius warming of the planet. That, is the cost of two decades of inaction thanks to a disinformation campaign by the fossil fuel industry. And the impacts are no longer subtle. Uh, we're now seeing them play out in real time. You don't have to use your imagination. It's not just about polar bears off in the Arctic um, or penguins in the Antarctic. Uh, climate change is now about devastating extreme weather events that we are now dealing with 
in real time here in the United States, in Europe, unprecedented heat waves and droughts, uh, wildfires, superstorms, floods. This is the face of climate change. Um, it's arrived. By some measure, dangerous climate change has arrived. I spent a sabbatical last year in Australia. I arrived in time to witness perhaps the most profound climate change event that we've ever seen play out, the bushfires that blanketed the continent of Australia. I was there, I saw the smoke, I saw the fires, um, I lived through that. That's the face of climate change, it's here. Dangerous climate change has arrived. At this point, it's a matter simply of how bad we're willing to let it get. And again, we see the headlines, hottest temperature ever uh, recorded on uh, reliably on this planet um, was last summer. And yet we're having some cold weather right now in Texas. Um, it's not record cold. It's um, sort of 1960s, 1970s cold, what we call an old fashioned winter. And we still expect to get bouts of extreme winter uh, events uh, because of just the vagaries of year to year weather. There is an interesting question about whether climate change might actually be creating a more favorable environment for pieces of the polar vortex to basically break off and drift south. Um, and, and we have seen those sorts of events in recent years, but we're not seeing record cold. Um, even this winter in Texas, it's not record cold, it's just old fashioned cold. We are seeing record heat. Again, this summer, hottest temperature ever reliably recorded on this planet. And the bushfires of Australia, as I arrived back in the United States, the West Coast was experiencing the same thing, unprecedented wildfires in California, the West Coast, Colorado, and wow, the West was on fire, the Gulf Coast was experiencing an unprecedented hurricane season, Atlantic hurricane season, 30 named storms. I'm proud of the fact that our team actually made the best prediction, the most accurate prediction of the more than dozen uh, different teams that make these sorts of seasonal pre-season forecasts of the Atlantic hurricane season. Um, but our forecast wasn't bullish enough. We predicted as many as 24 named storms, there were 30. I didn't think I would live to see a year with 30 named storms in the Atlantic, but that's what we witnessed this year. And we know that the unprecedented uh, hurricane activity we're seeing in the Atlantic, in particular, um, the intensities of these storms. And we've seen record strength storms in all of the major hurricane producing basins of the world in recent years as sea surface temperatures have been, have been at their highest levels. And we know that there's a relationship between the warmth of the ocean and the amount of energy that's available to intensify these storms, potentially into uh, monster storms like we've seen in recent years. And there is one particular satellite image that really captures the, the face of climate change um, in a profound way. Uh, this was in late October, and you can see the satellite image of this late season um, Hurricane Epsilon. This was the 26th name storm of the season. We were well into late October, and we were well into the Greek alphabet, um, and the storms continued. And this hurricane, you see it here spinning out in the North Atlantic, uh, but at the upper sort of end, the upper uh, sort of part of this frame, you see uh, this brown color. That's wildfire smoke from Colorado that was entrained into this storm. So in this one satellite image, we've sort of captured dual impacts of climate change when it comes to dangerous extreme weather events impacting us here in the United States. The climate wars. So there has been a war uh, what I call the old war uh, on climate, um, on the science of climate change. And it was waged by fossil fuel interests like ExxonMobil, who, like I said, their own internal research told them that there was a real problem, but they hid that research and instead spent hundreds of millions of dollars attacking independent scientists, attacking the science linking the burning of fossil fuels to climate change. And even just a few years ago, uh, we had a House Science Committee that was led by a climate change denier, Lamar Smith of Texas. And I had an opportunity to testify 
to that committee. And I just want to play a little clip from that uh, testimony. Uh, according to an article that came out a few days ago in the journal Science, uh, Chairman Smith was on record at the Heartland Institute. This is a climate change denying Koch Brothers funded uh, outlet um, that has a climate change denier conference every year. And uh, Chairman Smith spoke at that conference. Dr. Mann, don't mischaracterize that. Well, let me, let me finish uh, my... No, they do not say that they are deniers and you should not say that they are either. Well, uh, we, we can have that discussion. I'd be happy to. Let well, me finish my statement. be accurate statement. in your description. Well, I, I stand by my statement. Right. Can I finish my uh, uh, point? I'd like to reclaim my time. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, he uh, indicated at this conference that he, according to science, and I'm quoting from them, he sees his role on this committee as to a tool to advance his political agenda rather than a forum to examine important issues facing the U.S. research community. As a scientist, I find that deeply disturbing. But Dr. Mann, who said that? Uh, this is according to Science Magazine, uh, one of the most respected um, and, outlets. And, and, and who are they quoting? Um, this is the uh, the author, uh, Jeffrey Mervis, who wrote that article. I, I'd be happy to send to committee the, okay. uh, the article. Uh, that is not known as an objective writer or magazine. Well, it's Science Magazine. Yeah, I, I, so there you go, um, in sort of the up is down, black is white world of climate change denial, where Science Magazine, um, perhaps the most, uh, you know, certainly one of the two most um, respected scientific journals um, in the world is dismissed as not objective um, because it's actually presenting science rather than pseudoscience or anti-science, the sort of pseudoscience and anti-science that climate change deniers promote. Um, I had a similar experience in Australia, where, as I mentioned, I was on sabbatical and uh, I, I was testifying, I was sorry, not testifying, I was participating in a national television show called Q&A, sort of a panel discussion about the issues um, of the day. And this particular episode of Q&A was focused on the bushfires, the Australian bushfires. Uh, I was invited along with another number of other individuals, including uh, a, a conservative Senator Jim Molan, who is uh, you know, the equivalent of a Republican in Australia and uh, is a climate change denier. And I thought I would play a, a short segment from the, the show you here. You said you get information across your desk every day, which leads you to doubt or be open-minded about the science. Yeah, I am what is that information? Oh, it's, a, it's a range of information which goes <laughs> It's, it's a range of, thank you. But, sorry, it's, we it's, just respectfully listen to this. Yeah, thank I'm you. just trying to get to the bottom of this. What is what is the evidence that you are relying I'm on? I'm not relying on evidence, Hamish. I am saying. You said it. You said it. But, but you said it. But, but this, is, this is why my mind is open. I would love to be convinced one way or the other, but to be prudent, what the government is doing is it's got a climate uh, uh, and emissions reduction policy and it is a good policy and it will mitigate risk to the maximum that it can and where risk cannot be mitigated it will it will adapt and and that's what we've got to work on is my yeah, question yeah, come on now mate um <laughs> And he's an American. Now, um, you know, you should keep an open mind, but not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> All right, I'll stop it there. Um, some of you may recognize that uh, Carl Sagan once used that line. Um, it was irresistible for me to use it in this context because this particular politician kept on saying he has an open mind, but in fact, he has denied um, the reality and impacts of climate change. Now, the bad news is that there is still some climate change denialism. We see it in the UK uh, just recently. Uh, Christopher Monckton, who's one of the more prime, uh, prominent uh, climate change deniers, um, said not too long ago, uh, as he was denying the impacts of climate change, that Himalayan glaciers are doing just fine. Well, unfortunately, if you've been following the news, you know that they're not doing just fine. Uh, there was a catastrophic collapse of a, a glacier, a Himalayan glacier that led to a flooding of a valley killed hundreds of people. And this may be, in fact, the most direct connection we've ever seen between climate change and human fatalities. That glacier would not have collapsed in the absence of human-caused planetary warming. And so we really can connect the dots. Um, sorry, Lord Moncton, the Himalayan glaciers aren't doing just fine. And the people who are impacted by that event certainly aren't doing just fine. 
The good news is that denial is largely uh, behind us. Um, we see a little bit of it now with the current uh, cold air outbreaks. Um, as I said before, we're not seeing record cold. Uh, and in fact, climate change might be creating more favorable uh, environments. Uh, even though winters are warmer overall, they may be punctuated by more extreme events. And there's some evidence that that may be happening. And so nothing here contradicts the science of climate change. But every time there is a cold snap, you'll hear some climate change deniers will suddenly become very animated and insist that this disproves 200 years of uh, physics and, and chemistry. Um, but that's largely behind us because as I said before, uh, we are now witnessing the impacts of climate change play out in real time. It just isn't credible in general for politicians and talking heads to claim that it's not happening, that it's not real. And so we've seen them not give up um, the, the forces of inaction, I call them the inactivists in the book, uh, fossil fuel interests, those doing their bidding, those promoting their agenda, um, have sort of changed their tactics. Now that it's very difficult to deny that climate change is real, that it's happening, um, they instead have turned to a, an array of uh, more insidious tactics that aim at uh, deflecting our attention from the impacts or dividing us, getting climate advocates arguing with each other, um, promoting false solutions, um, things that won't really solve the problem at its source but sound good, uh, and even promoting uh, doomism and despair because if they can convince you that it's too late to do anything, that potentially leads you down the same path of inaction as outright denial. So this is what I call the new climate war. And I wrote this book because Look, we're so close now to finally seeing the action that so many have worked hard um, to, uh, to, to realize for, for decades now. And yet there are these obstacles that are being thrown in our way by inactivists. And there are these tactics that they're using to at the very least slow down this transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy, a transition that has to happen rapidly if, we're to, uh, if we are to avert the worst impacts of climate change. And so it's important to understand these impacts, uh, the, these tactics, to identify them and to know how to push back at them because they really are the only thing now standing in our way as we seek to really meaningfully act on the defining challenge of our time, the climate crisis. So there's soft denial. Okay, oh, well, climate change is happening, but hey, it's not a problem. Uh, look, you know, here's Bjorn Lumberg, who calls himself the uh, skeptical environmentalist. He's actually neither. His true skepticism, as we know, is a good thing in science. Um, that's what this particular event in this particular organization is about, the promotion of real skepticism. But half-sided skepticism that disregards the overwhelming scientific evidence in, in, in face, you know, um, um, in, in favor of, uh, you know, the flimsiest arguments that don't hold the slightest bit of uh, truth, um, that's not skepticism, that's contrarianism or denial. And here we see, you know, Bjorn Lumberg focus on a very short segment in the sea level curve. You can see when he was saying, oh, look, sea level rise is slowing down. He picked a two-year period where there were some El Nino events and La Nina events that have a short-term impact. Um, no, you know, there was no good news there. We can see the long-term trend. And in fact, if anything, now we know sea level rise is accelerating as ice sheets are uh, starting to uh, collapse ahead of schedule sooner than we thought they would. But this is sort of the shtick to claim that, you know, climate change is not so bad. And look, you know, we'll destroy the economy if we do anything. We should just grow the economy by burning fossil fuels and we will just find a way to innovate. Um, the, the free market will somehow magically solve this problem on its own. Well, you know, Lumberg claims to be an economist, although he has almost no published work in the field, but his book was reviewed by a Nobel Prize winning economist, economist um, Joseph Stiglitz. And I'll just read the final line in Stiglitz's review. This book proves the aphorism that a little knowledge is dangerous. It's nominally about air pollution. It's really about mind pollution. Well said, Joseph Stiglitz. Uh, and we see others 
Michael Schellenberger, who co-founded the Breakthrough Institute. Again, sort of soft denial, not denying that climate change is real or human cause, but denying the impacts and claiming that, um, you know, that we don't really need to reduce our carbon emissions. Delay, another tactic, kicking the can down the road. Again, focusing on resilience and adaptation, anything but decarbonization. So that you sound like you're, you know, you're, you're talking a good game, you sound like you're doing something, but in fact, you're not supporting any meaningful action. And Scott Morrison, the current prime minister of Australia has engaged in that sort of delayism. Here in the US, you have people like Marco Rubio from a state that is being profoundly impacted by climate change, uh, where the citizens of his state are now having to deal with inundation from a global sea level rise. Uh, but he insists that they'll just adapt to that. We don't need to do anything about our carbon emissions. We just need to adapt, in this case, to sea level rise, I guess by growing fins and gills, because that's the only way that coastal residents could truly adapt to the literal inundation of their coastline. And, and that's happening in Florida and it's happening around the world as sea level continues to rise. Or geoengineering, kick the can down the road. Look, we don't need to reduce carbon emissions now because we've got this great solution that we can deploy in the future. Geoengineering will just shoot sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere to form particles that will reflect solar radiation back to space or we'll dump iron into the ocean to seed the algae to try to get them to take up more of the carbon dioxide. We'll just intervene in our planetary, with our planetary environment in an un unprecedented and uncontrolled manner in the hope that will somehow magically offset the warming impact of increasing greenhouse gas concentrations. What could possibly go wrong? Um, well, you know, you have some people who have quite a platform. Uh, Bill Gates has a book that just came out on climate change also. Um, and he has in fact supported uh, much of the geoengineering, uh, geoengineering research that's been done and actually argues that geoengineering is something we should consider implementing. Of course, uh, it comes with a great, uh, what's known as a moral hazard. Aside from the principle of unintended consequences, all of the things that could go wrong if we engage in these unprecedented activities. Uh, it provides an excuse for not doing the necessary uh, task of, of uh, reducing carbon emissions now. It's a way of kicking the can down the road. And so we should be aware of the fact that this is used as a delaying tactic from those who want to keep us in the meantime addicted to fossil fuels. Deflection. The crying Indian ad. Um, some of you, if you're of my generation, uh, grew up watching this ad, um, and it felt like this very empowering advertisement about how you know we could clean up the environment. Uh, it ended with the tagline, uh, "People cause pollution; only people can fix it." Um, and again, it, it empowered a whole generation into thinking that we can, you know, solve these problems on our own by just being better stewards of the environment, picking up those bottles and cans. Um, it was actually, um, it, it, it was um, supported by uh, several environmental organizations. Um, it was, uh, it, it was a, a product of the so-called Ad Council, um, and there are some uh, environmental organizations that were on board with it initially until they realized that they'd been had when they signed up, uh, when they signed on to this. It was actually a PR campaign hatched on Madison Avenue by Coca-Cola and the beverage industry. They didn't want to see bottle bills passed, um, which would re put a deposit on cans and bottles and require um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the companies, the corporations um, would be required to process those returned bottles and cans. It would hurt their bottom line. It would hurt their profits. And so instead they engaged in a massive campaign to convince the public that we didn't need bottle bills. It was just a matter of you and me being better stewards of the environment um, and making Iron Eyes uh, Cody, um, the Native American here, proud of us. Well, actually he wasn't a Native American, he was an Italian American, but as you now see, that was the least of the subterfuge that was behind this particular commercial. It was a deflection campaign to take our eyes 
off the need for regulatory solutions, systemic solutions to the problem, and simply make it about you and me. And as a result, thanks to the beverage industry, we have one of the other great environmental crises of our generation, the global plastic pollution crisis, thanks to this very successful deflection campaign. Well, the fossil fuel industry has been doing precisely the same thing. They've used the same playbook. They've used it uh, adroitly. Um, and they've even gotten mainstream outlets like the New York Times to play into this framing so that we're just bombarded with framing about all of the things that we can do in our individual daily lives to reduce our carbon emissions, almost to the exclusion of con contextual pieces about the need for systemic change, for policies, carbon pricing, subsidies for renewable energy, uh, preventing uh, additional fossil fuel infrastructure um, from being built. Um, there's so much focus on individual action that it almost crowds out uh, the discussion about the needed systemic changes. And look, these are all things that we should do. You know, there are things that we can do in our everyday lives um, that reduce our environmental footprint, our carbon footprint. Uh, they make us um, healthier, they save us money, they make us feel better about ourselves. They uh, send you know, a message to other people, they set a good example for others. We should clearly do these things, uh, do what we can to reduce our impact on the environment and on climate. But what we can't allow is for individual action to be framed as the exclusive solution to the problem to the point where it becomes a crutch for fossil fuel interests, for polluters to not be held to um, held uh, responsible for reducing their carbon uh, emissions. Look, uh, BP, British Petroleum, gave us the first carbon individual carbon footprint calculator back in the early 2000s because they wanted us focused on our carbon footprint, not theirs. 70% of our global carbon emissions comes from a few dozen uh, fossil fuel companies. They don't want us looking at their carbon footprint and doing something about that. They want us focused on our own carbon footprint. And we see that framing, uh, you know, and, and we at times see, um, you know, politicians like Elizabeth Warren call it out for, for what it is. And I was happy to see her do that in one of the democratic debates uh, last year. But this is one of the ways that the inactivists have thwarted um, the, uh, you know, the passage of climate friendly policies by convincing us that it's just a matter of individual behavior. We don't need a price on carbon. We don't need subsidies for renewable energy. We just need individuals to be more responsible in their daily lives. Uh, division, well, this is a great way to divide people, right? You get climate advocates arguing with each other about their carbon purity, about their individual carbon footprint. Um, it's a threefer for the inactivists. You deflect attention away from systemic solutions. It's a divide and conquer uh, sort of approach to uh, defeating climate advocates, um, to preventing climate advocates from sort of prevent, uh, presenting a, a united front demanding change. You just generate infighting among them. And then finally, you use this to discredit critical thought leaders and opinion leaders in the climate space. And, you know, you've seen the attacks against Leonardo DiCaprio and Al Gore over their supposed uh, individual excesses. And usually these are based on um, distortions, if not, out, if, if not outright uh, fabrications of their alleged irresponsible behavior. But the, the idea is to paint them as hypocrites and discredit them as climate messengers. And we just recently saw that with the Murdoch media over the last month or so, them going after John Kerry, our new special envoy on climate, the new climate czar, trying to discredit him by focusing on his use of air travel. It's one of the classic uh, fronts in the new climate war. Um, sometimes even those you might think of as friend turn out to be foe. Uh, Michael Moore, this progressive icon who put out a film last year, Planet of the Humans, that basically tries to undermine renewable energy, the most viable solution to the climate crisis. And look, I don't know why Michael Moore chose to do that. You could argue that maybe um, it's been a long time since he's 
had um, a, a successful uh, film venture. It was a way of sort of generating some attention. Wow, look, liberal icon Michael Moore comes out against renewable energy. It's a man bites dog story that was likely to attract some attention. Um, but he couldn't actually get the film carried by a major distributor. It, ran, it ended up running um, online on, uh, on, on uh, uh, YouTube, I, I believe, for free. And look, I don't know why Michael Moore chose to do that. What I do know is who was promoting that film. It wasn't the environmental community. It wasn't climate advocates. It was fossil fuel industry front groups. It was the Murdoch press. It was Breitbart News. That tells you everything you need to know. Doomism, I already alluded to this. Look, if it's too late for us to do anything about the problem, then why bother acting? And there are a lot of people of good intentions, goodwill, who fall victim to this doomist framing, which is largely built on distortions of the science that are as bad as the distortions by climate change deniers. The claim that runaway warming is inevitable and there's nothing we can do and all life on earth will be extinguished within 10 years. There are sort of cult figures in the climate doomist community who literally try to make that case. Um, and it's based on an outright misrepresentation. There's no scientific evidence for such a thing. But if you believe that to be true, then it may very well lead you to disengage, to not even bother trying to do anything about the problem. It's an ingenious way of climate and activists to actually convince some who would otherwise be on the front lines demanding action, environmental activists, if you can convince them it's too late to do anything, then you've weaponized uh, people on the progressive side, the environmental progressive side of the spectrum. Um, it's, a, it's a huge win for the forces of inaction. So we have to push back on ill-premised uh, doomism. There is urgency, no question about that. We've seen the evidence for that. But there is agency. We can still do something about this problem. And we know what the solution is. Sorry, Bill Gates, we don't need a miracle. Bill Gates uh, insists we need a miracle to solve this problem and there has uh, insisted this in the past. We don't need a miracle. The solution is before us. It's wind, solar, geothermal. It's just a matter of having the incentives to scale up these technologies. We don't need magic new technologies. We don't need to implement dangerous uh, you know, technologies like geoengineering. Uh, sorry, Bill Gates. We just need to incentivize the solutions that we already have to scale them up. And we're turning the corner. We've seen carbon emissions globally flatline. That's great, but as we saw, flat line isn't enough. We've got to come down that slope and we've got to do it quickly. We've got to decarbonize the economy rapidly, bring carbon emissions down by a factor of two within the next 10 years to avert catastrophic one and a half degrees Celsius warming. So we need to continue the trend that's underway. Last year, carbon emissions came down 7%. They had actually come down in the electricity sector a little bit the previous year. This year, total carbon emissions came down 7%. And part of that is due to the pandemic. We know that. Uh, the economic slowdown, lockdowns, uh, social distancing policies, um, decreased transportation. We know that that's part of it. But part of it is attributable to the shift towards renewable energy. And so the good news is we brought carbon emissions down by 7% last year. If we can keep that up each year for the next 10 years, we will be on the path to limiting warming below those catastrophic levels. That's the good news. The bad news is we've gone about as far as you can go with sort of behavioral change. To continue to decrease carbon emissions 7.5% every year for the next nine years, we need to decarbonize our economy. Um, we need fundamental structural changes in our energy economy. And there's some good news there. Um, the Kerry administration has demonstrated, um, you know, the boldest commitment that we have ever seen of any presidency to climate action. Uh, just within the first month of the administration, uh, we have seen an array of executive actions that go about as far as you could go with executive actions towards implementing something like a Green New Deal. Now we will need to see it complemented by legislation and we have a democratic Congress now that will almost certainly pass some sort of climate legislation that will complement the executive actions taken by the administration. But more than anything else, the United States has returned to the world stage. 
the United States is back. We're back and we're ready to lead again. And that has huge implications for global progress on this issue. Um, it puts a lot of pressure on intransigent actors like Scott Morrison in Australia. And we've already seen him changing his tune, changing his language, feeling that pressure. So there's reason to be optimistic that we're gonna see some real action now here in the United States. And that's gonna influence the entire global conversation as has the youth climate movement. Um, children coming out, uh, demanding action, demanding accountability by the adults of the world so that we don't degrade this planet for them, for future generations. There's still time to do that. And I hope that that's our legacy, that we can, they will look back and say that their parents saw the crisis in time and we acted in time so that we didn't leave behind a degraded planet for future generations. That is still a possible future but only if we work at it. Thank you very much. Look forward to our discussion. Hey, all right, Michael, thank you very much for that. Oh, I, we have a lot of questions, but right before we get to that, there were, I don't, I don't know if you added all these up. There are a lot of Ds in there. Uh, we have denial, deflection, division, discrediting, Dumas, and if, when we listen to the Dumas, we disengage. Like, I feel there's a t-shirt in there. For well, <laughs> I, I, I am a, uh, a, a fan of alliteration and tried to use it in the framing of this book. <laughs> well, well done. Absolutely well done. Thank you. And that, that actually helps it cement into, uh, into people's minds. So It's um, amazing how many D words there are that really are relevant. It, it, it's, yeah. It, <laughs> I, I was taking note. I'm like, well, we can't have. Once I start, I'm paying attention. I'm like, well, there can't be another D word. Yes, there is. <laughs> and and, and they're I've forgotten. Is, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. But might I add that it is delightful <laughs> that you did that. But we do indeed have a, quite a few questions that um, I'd like to get to. Um, let's see. And 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 forgive me if I say anyone's name wrong. But Albert, I think I can get your name right. How do we address uh, Bjorn Lomborg's take on how we are able to respond to the challenges brought on by climate change? And I, I, I think you really hit that home with the, the Indian and, you know, people taken in by the, the tear. Um, but yeah, I mean, that I, I'm, I'm recycling bottles and cans as we speak, you know, is, is that should we not be doing that? Is it or is it? Is that? I'm sorry, Albert asked it well. Yeah, no, how do we deal with folks like uh, Bjorn Lomberg? Obviously we tar and feather them, right? I mean, no, I'm just kidding. We, we don't do that, <laughs> but we, we push back against their, their rhetoric, right? We recognize it for what it is. It's a kinder, gentler form of denial. It's the sort of denial that is, uh, you know, th that can, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that can still exist in polite company. Um, and so in that, in that sense, it's more pernicious. It's, it, it's almost more dangerous. It's more insidious because it still leads us down the same path. When Lumberg says, look, we just, we don't need a price on carbon, or if we do put one, it should, uh, one car, it should be really small and we should just let the free market sort it out. Well, no, look, economists, you know, like Joseph Stiglitz, Put, you know, put the lie to that uh, claim. Um, these, he's a Nobel Prize winning economist and he certainly understands that you need a market signal. If you're gonna solve a problem that currently is an environmental uh, externality, which is to say, it's a tragedy of the commons. It's something that isn't incorporated into our economic decision-making. So there's no incentive to fix the problem. Um, it hurts everybody but if it doesn't hurt the profits of the fossil fuel industry, it doesn't get fixed. So we need those incentives. We need subsidies for renewable energy. We need a price on carbon. We need things that level the playing field. Those are what we call demand side measures. We also need supply side measures, stopping the additional construction of pipelines. And, and Biden is doing that. The Keystone XL pipeline has been canceled. Uh, the Biden administration isn't going to allow uh, for additional fossil fuel infrastructure on public lands. So. Though we, we need action sort of on the demand side, on the supply side, we need less demand for fossil fuels, we need less supply for fossil fuels. And economists understand that. They, they understand that without those measures, you're not gonna solve the problem. Uh, the you know apologists like Bjorn Lumberg wear a Greenpeace t-shirt. He wears a nice Greenpeace t-shirt to brandish his environmental bona fides while he tries to feed you 
with a whole bunch of rhetoric that will lead you down the primrose path of climate inaction. And so we have to recognize the perniciousness of those who sound like they support action, but the words are empty. It's empty rhetoric that doesn't lead to the solutions we need. Um, this is a, a, a question that occurred to me, you know, while you were speaking and asking this question, answering this question, wouldn't it just be cheaper? You know, the money that these companies spend fighting doing the right thing, wouldn't it be just cheaper to do the right thing? I, I mean, it, it, I haven't worked out the numbers. I haven't done the math, but that's a lot of negative energy, forgive the pun, in the wrong direction. Yeah, you know, it's the problem is that corporations don't have a soul. <laughs> um, oh, they oh, but they are people. <laughs> they, they are people. Oh, yes. Uh, you're quoting our good friend Mitt Romney. People right. are, uh, <laughs> yes, um, my friend. They're bad people. Absolutely. <laughs> but corporations are people, my friend. Um, you know, and Mitt Romney actually gave us cap and trade um, for as a climate solution when he was governor of Massachusetts, he was actually on the right track at that point, um, and has shown some uh, some evidence that maybe he's coming back into the fold on some of these things. Um, and look, we're going to need some moderate Republicans on board if we're going to get meaningful legislation on climate. It's probably not going to be done. You know, there's the possibility it could be done through Senate recollect uh, reconciliation, literally 50 Democrats and um, Kamala Harris to, to break the tie on a strictly party line basis. But I don't think that's the way it's gonna happen. I think we're gonna get a half dozen uh, moderate Republicans who don't want to, you know, their children, grandchildren to look back at them as having been on, on the wrong side of the defining challenge of our generation, of our era. So yeah, I like, I, I, I believe, um, you know, in playing to our better, better angels and, you know, fossil fuel CEOs, energy company CEOs are people those people do, I think most of them, care about their children and grandchildren. So I think there is an opportunity to connect with people in the business community. And you do see that in certain industries, in the finance industry, we're seeing a lot of action. We're seeing the, the leading finance um, you know, companies in the world saying, we're gonna reconsider whether we are going to continue to finance fossil fuel projects. Why? Well, because they're bad investments in the long term. If we decide we have to leave those fossil fuels in the ground, that's not a good investment. But moreover, we have a fiduciary responsibility to our investors. And part of the sort of larger vision of fiduciary responsibility is to not destroy the planet that your investors live on. And so I think that that <laughs> is coming into it. I think that is playing into it. And we're seeing some movement there. So I think there is potential to play to the better angels, even in the corporate world, because in the end, corporations are run by people. Right. I, I, I love that you, you've tied in how we can, you know, go, go with our better angels by making the business case for it, you know, so I, <laughs> right. how, do, how do we combine? How do we do both? Right, um, we can do there, both. There are a lot of uh, folks who are, are asking a similar question yeah. um, a, about the possibility of nuclear power as a renewable energy and does does that fit in? And if it does, how can we make people feel comfortable with that? I think Gen X and, and up, you know, nuclear, no, it's very, it's still a very scary thing for people. Or if you're of my generation, it's nuclear because that's how oh, Jimmy Carter wow. said it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, uh, you know, it's that is a, that I wish that's the debate we were having right now in, in Congress, that the role of the different sort of climate, you know, uh, the, the different options uh, when it comes to climate solutions, because I, I think there's a legitimate political debate to be had about the role of nuclear energy. And I, I resist sort of weighing in too prescriptively, pre, uh, uh, too prescriptively on that. But I do talk about this in the book, and I do point out, you know, a couple things. Uh, first of all, if you like nuclear energy, a lot of it's very popular with a lot of political conservatives, and I have to think that some of that is just due to sort of uh, hippie bashing. Like, who are the people who are protesting in the '60s and '70s? It was these, you know, flower children and granola crunchers, and so, you know the opposite must, you know, if those are the people who are in support, who are against nuclear energy, then I have to be for it, because I think that's part of it, just the cultural image of nuclear. Um, but it doesn't make sense. And even my, uh, uh, you know, e e even uh, my good friend, Bob Inglis, who was a former 
Republican congressman from South Carolina who's become sort of a, a conservative climate advocate. Um, and he's talked about this. He's, he's pointed out that it actually, fellow conservatives, nuclear doesn't make sense. If you are in support of the market and market mechanisms, uh, nuclear energy isn't viable in the free market. It can only be deployed with massive government investment. And that massive government investment is then diverting funds, is crowding out investment in a solution that's safer, that doesn't come with the same hazards that nuclear comes with. Proliferation issues, mil military uh, you know, security risks, um, obviously nuclear contamination uh, risks. If we can solve this problem in a way that doesn't force us uh, to confront those risks, then I think we should go the safer path. And so in the end, I weigh down, I, 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 I come down uh, with um, you know, other advocates who argue that we can get there from renewable energy alone and don't necessarily have to invest in, in some of these other potentially riskier options. But that's my opinion. I don't want to force that to be our policy. I want us to have that debate as, as a people, as a society. There's a good faith debate uh, to, to be had, uh, and there will need to be some compromise. And I believe there will need to be some compromise with conservatives to get some sort of consensus moving forward. So, you know, that's that's sort of where I stand on that. All right. Well, if we can get them to to not deny, that would be that would be nice. With that. Um, uh, how, and this is this is a simple, deceptively simple question um, from David Palermo. Thank you, David. How do we get off fossil fuels in a way that makes sense financially? Yeah. So thanks, David. It's a great question, and it's one you know that we come up uh, against all the time. The the critics, the inactivists, have been very effective at framing this falsely as a choice, a false uh, choice between our economy and you know climate action and 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 you know we can use sort of re reducto ad, ad absurdum you know reasoning to see why that's flawed um the the that eventually you know that sort of reasoning uh, takes us down you know this path of you know there, there is no economy on a dead planet right so clearly <laughs> in that limit in that limit it doesn't make sense to think of these as trade-offs um and the reality is that you know there are far more jobs available in installation of renewables than there are in fossil fuels. Uh, the fossil fuel lobby has been very effective, and the politicians and the Murdoch press, the conservative media that do their bidding, have been very effective in sort of creating this echo chamber, uh, these talking points that have penetrated into our consciousness. Um, like, you know, if we cancel the Keystone XL pipeline, we're going to put thousands and thousands of people out of business. There may be a hundred permanent jobs in the Keystone XL pipeline. Once it's built, there are a hundred permanent jobs, thousands of permanent jobs in, in the renewable energy industry. So from a job standpoint, it makes more sense to, to invest in, in renewables. Um, the cost of inaction though, the damage that's being done by these unprecedented extreme weather events, and we can debate the, the precise role that climate change might be having with what we're seeing play out in Texas, but it is an example of how the, the detrimental, the catastrophic impacts that more extreme weather events are having now. And so if you measure the, the, the true cost of um, climate inaction in terms of the damage done and the loss of life done by these extreme weather events, then you know, and just the damage, environmental damage done uh, by uh, fossil fuel extraction, air quality, water quality issues, the human health and, and, and fatalities that arise from that. If you total the, the cost, and, and I've seen estimates as much as 20% of fatalities are due to air pollution that um, is a result of fo uh, fossil fuel um, energy uh, extraction. It, if you do a full cost accounting, then it makes far more sense to act on climate than to not act on a purely economic basis, let alone all of the moral and ethical dimensions of this issue. Um, again, making the business case, because that's how you're going to sell it. That's how you're possibly going to get people to turn around. <laughs> got to sell um, the business case. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, we're getting a bunch of um, questions about uh, could carbon capture work? 
it, it could work. There's no question about that. Um, the question is, uh, one of the things that's been pointed out, for example, Mark Jacobson, who's a, a, a energy policy expert um, from Stanford University, has sort of looked at the true impact of investing, say, in carbon capture and sequestration or, or direct air capture. And basically, the argument he makes is that when you take into account the health impacts from fossil fuel extraction, because that will still be there, um, even if you bury, capture the carbon and bury it, you have these other impacts, water quality, uh, air quality, um, and you're crowding out investment in alternatives like renewable energy that don't, don't come with those costs. So, so he argues that carbon capture and sequestration is not a, a cost effective um, uh, solution. It makes more sense to invest that same money in renewable energy than to burn the carbon and try to capture it. And that's not even taking into account, and I, I go through this in the book in some detail, in the new climate war. Um, even the very best case, um, you're talking about maybe you could capture 90% of the carbon um, that's released from, uh, you know, from a coal-fired power plant, for example. Um, and so that 10% you're not capturing, and potentially the leakage of methane, which is an even worse greenhouse gas, although it acts on a shorter time frame, uh, you could end up uh, still contributing substantially to climate change, even if you're using, you know, coal um, burning with uh, capture and, and sequestration. And again, you're crowding out investment in something that isn't leaking carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, renewable energy. So I just don't find a compelling argument today for carbon capture and sequestration. I see it more as being used by some, once again, as a crutch. Look, we'll be able to capture this stuff. No, really, trust me. Trust us. 20 years from now, we're going to have this amazing technology. We're going to be able to suck that carbon right out of the atmosphere and, and turn it into food that we, you know, it's easy to try to kick the can down the road. And it's very effective. It's a very effective strategy if you want to burn, continue to sell and burn carbon now and make huge profits from doing so. I, uh, I have two, I'm gonna do two back-to-back -back book questions here. Daniel Klein is being charitable and he says he believes that, that Bill Gates means well, uh, but can you I agree. elaborate on, on maybe some of his flawed arguments yeah. or, or, or about solutions for climate change? Yeah, you know, and I actually have a, a commentary that'll be coming out sometime next week that sort of okay. takes that view. Look, it's good that Bill Gates is, is bringing you know, public awareness to this issue that he's using his platform to 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 create, you know, uh, you know, to get us talking ab about this crisis, and and that's all good. Um, and as I've already said, we can disagree about the prescription, and I do disagree. Um, he is uh, less uh, optimistic about the role that renewable energy can make over the next several decades. I think he's wrong on that. I think there's research that demonstrates that we can scale up, you know, to 100% renewable energy by 2050, 80% by 2035. Um, he's dismissive of that research. And I don't think mm. he has the right to be dismissive of that research. And if you are dismissive of the role that renewable energy can play in this transition, it almost forces you then to accept some of those risky alternatives like geoengineering, like um, you know, uh, nuclear, and we've already had that discussion here. And so where I come down is great. Let's have that debate. You know, let's put Bill Gates at the table, put, you know, Mark Jacobson at the table. Um, let's have that debate because that's a worthy debate. Um, let's get past the debate about whether we have a crisis and whether we need to do something. And, and hopefully right. let's bring at least moderate conservatives on board to, you know, to the notion that we need to do something and we can debate what precisely we need to do. I have my views of how we should do it, but I don't feel that I am in the position to, to, to prescribe what the solutions should be. Um, I'm perfectly happy just having a role in that conversation. And Bill Gates should have a role. In, he clearly does have a role. It turns out that right. when you're a multi-billionaire, um, you can actually get a lot of media for your book. Um, and yeah, he, so he's yeah. getting his message out there. Indeed, indeed. And it, it might even make up for Windows Vista if we are. Yeah, well, honest. nothing will make up for that. Maybe <laughs> let's, just, let's admit that. He's never going to atone for. No, sorry. <clears throat> we, no, of course. No, we are, we are at um, almost almost eight o'clock. Um, I, I do want to say one thing, though. 
yeah, why don't we allow the guy who gave us the Windows operating system to determine how we're going to engineer the plan? <laughs> he's he's grown. He's changed. It's a, it's a, he's a different yes. man. Yeah. Um, but I was going to say we're we're very close to eight, and I do have a couple more questions that I I'm happy to go a little over if other people. Okay, want to. that's yeah. what I wanted to make sure. I wanted to make yeah. sure. Um, and I did say this was sort of a joint uh, book question. Uh, we, I'm very thrilled that we have very smart people in our audience. And uh, we actually got the question of, can you recommend uh, uh, any book recommendations for people who want to immerse themselves in the data of climate change? You know, people who I guess want to want to get their hands dirty and, and, and really understand what's going on. Can you recommend? Uh, oh, absolutely. Questions? I can. Let me introduce I you love it. the <laughs> dire predictions <laughs> understand. <laughs> um, and uh, Leanne gets uh, 50 cents on each dollar that we make selling. There are a number of really good books out there. I've written some. Uh, you know, you can, um, you you can, um, you know. I'm, I'm trying to think of uh, some of the. There, there is almost a glut of climate books over the last ten years. There are a lot of really good, um, you know, climate science books. Um, I've written some. Uh, I, um, you know, uh, if you really want to get into the like the nerdy physics details, uh, Ray Pierre Humbert has a really geeky book that gets into the math and the physics, um, and it's really hardcore. Um, and you're, if you know you're somebody with sort of math and physics chops, you could dig into Ray Pierre Humbert's uh, book. Um, it's a, a more, um, you know, far more technical uh, approach. And then there's everything in between. So I would say Dire Predictions, this was supposed to be a user-friendly book uh, about climate change, translating the reports of the IPCC to, you know, terms that are readily understandable by a lay public. That's sort of at one end of the spectrum. At the other end, you've got Ray Pierre Humbert, um, his, his book uh, on climate science. And I'm sure I could think of others, um, but I would also say that you know there are a lot of great resources online as well. If you don't want to actually have to spend the money to to purchase a book, um, even though Dire Predictions is really cheap, no, um, then you know you can. Uh, there is an online a free online course that I actually designed for um, uh, the uh, sustainable uh, the uh, development. Um, uh, uh, what are the SD, uh, the, uh, now I'm forgetting the name of the organization, but um, uh, you can Google it online, Michael Mann, free course on, on climate change. Um, um, it's part of the UN sustainability effort. Uh, they have a bunch of online courses and, and my course is sort of uh, an introduction into climate science. It's free. I think you pay $50 to get a certificate. Um, you, um, you know, there are resources like Skeptical Science. I love Skeptical Science. Uh, it's a website that has like all of the, the talking points that you encounter, all the climate change denial talking points that you encounter at Thanksgiving with, you know, Uncle Charlie who watches, you know, Fox News and he comes armed with the latest arguments as to why climate change is a hoax. And you can say, well, you know, Uncle Charlie, because you can be on your iPhone, right? And it's like on the site and Uncle Charlie, that's number four on the skeptical science list. And what the science actually says is the planet is warming up and we know that because of blah, 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 blah. So wow. there, there, you know, and, uh, and following, you know, good people on social media, you know, science, uh, climate science folks, uh, you know, my, uh, I obviously, I'm on uh, Twitter, Michael E. Mann, my friend uh, Gavin Schmidt, who's the uh, director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and uh, NASA's official climate expert now um, in the new administration. Uh, he's very active on social media. Um, and so you can engage with scientists directly. And if you have questions, um, you can ask us, you know, and, and sometimes we actually reply. So um, there are lots of ways to, to sort of get that information. And it's just a matter of sort of what level of information you want. Uh, skeptical science will give you an introductory response, an intermediate and an advanced response. It's one of the things I like uh, for each of those, you know, talking That's points. That's great. And I, I love that you are not shying away from the Thanksgiving dinner arguments. Yes. You know, and so trying important. to be polite. It's like, no, no, pass the turkey and the facts. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> the turkey not... is your uncle and you need to convince the turkey uh, of, you know, yeah. the reality of climate change. But um, 
this is a bit of an, an aggregate question from folks. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll get ready to close, but I, I do want to get this one in. As, yeah. um, is, is any country doing a good job implementing policies to combat climate change? Because common, you know, carbon emissions don't know borders. Yeah, you know, there, there are countries, I mean, Iceland <clears throat> is, does a wonderful <laughs> job, Iceland. you know. They're really cold, right? And you would think they would have to burn lots of fossil fuels. They've got geothermal energy, actually. They got a lot of it. Um, uh, and so you can point to some countries that sort of have the luxury of, um, you know, uh, a, 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 the luxury of an abundance of, you know, renewable uh, resources, um, you know, in the Scandinavian countries, um, a number of the European countries um, have done very well. Uh, you know, New Zealand, uh, other than the dairy is their main issue is the methane from, from dairy, in fact. Um, yeah. But a lot of countries that have, um, you know, responsible climate policies are, you know, are, are dramatically reducing carbon emissions and are on a, a, a path to decarbonizing their economy. Germany is a good example. They're doing a great job and they've used market mechanisms like feed-in tariffs um, to, to accomplish that. So, you know, here in the United States, we do have an abundance of renewable resource, energy resources. We've got wind, we've got solar, we've got geothermal, we have all the tools. We just need the commitment on the part of our politicians. Michael, thank you so much. And uh, to, to everyone in the audience uh, who put in some very thoughtful, um, if not very long, <laughs> questions. <laughs> thank you for the engagement. I, I have to think that the, the, the best question um, and a compliment to your presentation is how do I learn more? Because um, uh, I, I, this can't answer everything, but if this, this sort of whets people's appetites to, to know more, then sir, I think you've done um, a good job because this is a well, big Well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Week. Oh, oh, absolutely. And I just want to remind everyone in the audience that if you missed any of this, the recording of this event will be available tomorrow at skepticalinquirer.org. And I would love to remind you that our next guest in this series will be here on March 4th. We are welcoming back uh, Paul Offit, and he'll be talking with us about SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS vaccines. Where do we stand? I want to know myself. That'll be good. Um, my, my thanks to Skeptical Inquirer, CFI, the tech team of The Amazing Mark, um, and to you, the audience, and Michael, of course, you for sharing your, your time, talent, and expertise. And my name is Leanne Lord. Thank you, and good night. Thank you, Leanne. It was a real pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>